Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the WTF1 podcast pre-race edition. Tommy and Katie, were you waving in sync then? or did I don't think I didn't, we were. I didn't really see that. I, th- I saw Tommy still waving. And anyway, very disappointing. Oh. Clearly, you need to get your act together uh, uh, before our post-race podcast. Anyway, Azerbaijan Grand Prix. Uh, I think a lot of people actually are enjoying the fact that we're doing a podcast when we've actually had a session of Grand Prix racing, not, well, not racing, but practice. Uh, so we're doing another one on a Friday. And we've got, obviously, some news to, to talk to you about what's going on in Azerbaijan. But uh, first of all, I have to, of course, say contractually, Tom Bellingham, the WTF1 founder <laughs> and verified on Twitter still, uh, and me not. Thank you, Twitter. Still waiting for the reply. And Katie, who got denied uh, by Twitter, didn't you? Uh, the WTF1 got- editor rejected so i've been crying about that all week um and i'm going to go to the fia with a protest along with possibly some other teams this weekend i think oh that's a good good little segue good little segue um, <laughs> kind of not not getting to that just good yet, segue actually. into the third point we'll be talking <laughs> yeah yeah we'll segue <laughs> into that a little try. bit later on uh firstly before we talk about azerbaijan and what's going on in baku uh we've just heard that uh, singapore is set to be cancelled uh, as seen uh, from what the BBC is stating, and it's 99% official. So uh, probably by the time this goes out, it will have been announced that Singapore is not going ahead, which is a shame. Of course, another street track, um, well, I say another street track, as in we've had two street track tracks in a row. Of course, Singapore, uh, we won't be going there. I'm I'm not massively upset from a racing spectacle point of view, but uh, it is quite a, a cool place to go. And uh, it being a night race, of course, as well, is, is obviously quite a, a cool thing to be on the calendar as well. So, you know, it's, it's never a, a nice feeling to have uh, a track drop off the calendar, especially for the fans that are out there. Yeah, it's, it's not come as the biggest surprise, I guess. I guess the biggest surprise has been the fact that Monaco and Baku have gone ahead no problem, because I think we said, didn't we, that Canada, uh, those two, Canada and Singapore, would be the ones under threat. Now, Canada's gone. Uh, Singapore, like you say, 99% gone. Um, and we might have a double quota potentially, as, as in America. So, at the Americas, so that would be quite interesting. Let's just hope one of them is in reverse or something. That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's another um, jiggling around of the uh, calendar. So, yeah, unfortunate. But I really like Singapore. I know it doesn't provide us with the most insane races. Like we've had a few brilliant moments over the last few years, but. Um, I'll be sad to see it go, but I'm afraid that's just street circuits at the moment and organising travel with COVID restrictions and being in city centres. It's just, it's not quite possible. Like Tommy said, we're very lucky to have had Monaco, although some people will say I'd rather have Singapore over Monaco. But rather have um, a and, track. Yeah. <laughs> um, but maybe two races at Kota will be good. I mean, Formula One have been saying for ages that they want to have two races in America, obviously Kota, and we've got Miami happening next year. Um, but Kota's a huge fan favourite. They sell out almost every year. So I'm sure Formula Please. One will be happy to put another race there. Yeah, I hope they mix it up a little bit because you had the, the double-headed, didn't you, in Austria last year where they didn't change the tyres and then in Silverstone they did have different tyre compounds and it made it a little bit more interesting and the results were a little bit different. Um, so I hope if they do do these double headers, which it looks like they're going to do, um, then maybe mix up a little bit. And then what can be done with Kota, apart from literally doing it in reverse, but uh, they, that, they, it's not yeah, Mario Kart. So no, I, I don't and think there'll be many... fans there, so you can't really mess yeah. about too much. I don't think they'll change it at all, to be honest. And I, I'm not against having a double race at Kota anyway. I think it's one of the better tracks out there. Um, it is a Herman Tilke design, isn't it? That one. It's just one um, of his best. But it's definitely. a yeah, yeah. So definitely a good one, uh, not Abu Dhabi, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, so so yeah, no, I'm I'm not against that at all. I think Kota will be a, a great thing to have maybe two races at and throw a bucket of water on there for the second race. Uh, but I don't think there'll be any any layout changes. Okay, so there you go. Singapore set to be cancelled. Big shame, but maybe if it's double Kota, it's not too bad. Let's let's turn our attentions now to Azerbaijan, the windy city. Yeah. Now. now I'm pretty sure all of us pretty much predicted that Mercedes were going to be very quick around here. At at the very least, it was myself and Tommy. I don't want to speak for you, Katie, but I feel like it was a general consensus that uh, that Mercedes wouldn't be slow or struggling. Um, But yeah, FP1 and FP2 were quite out of sorts for Mercedes and Toto Wolff himself apparently denied any interviews because he wanted to go straight to 
learning why on earth they're so slow. So in FB2, they were 11th and 16th. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination saying that's where they're going to be come Saturday or Sunday. But the question is now, you know, are Mercedes genuinely slow to a degree or are they sandbagging? You know, I joked, I said that, you know, there won't be any sand on the beaches because, you know, because Mercedes, are, are, you know, <laughs> filled their bags up. But at the same time, they, they clearly are struggling. Our done zero says, is the Mercedes car not suited to street circuits as we saw in Monaco and here in Baku with both Mercedes in 11th and 16th? Well, as I said, I think our expectations were that Mercedes would sort their, their troubles out in Baku. It's a, it's a, it's a much different track to, to Monaco. You know, they're two completely different sort of challenges, even though they are both street circuits. It doesn't mean they're set up at all the same because Monaco is very high downforce. You come to Baku and it's stripped of that completely and it's skinny wings because I've got such long straights. So I think, yeah, it's just the, the problems continue to to happen really in this season. They, I, I just don't feel like they've got their head around how to set this car up, especially on the Fridays. Yeah, when Hamilton pre-race uh, weekend was saying like, oh, Red Bull are favourites and we're going to be struggling, I was ready to be like, oh, boo-hoo, underdogs again. Uh, and by struggling, normally for Mercedes means they finish second and third, not first and second. Um, but yeah, it's a big surprise. I know it's only practice, but that being said, yeah, the, the comparisons between Monaco and Baku, it's not that similar. Um, the long wheelbase Mercedes uh, has kind of struggled sometimes around Monaco, even when Mercedes were dominant, like really dominant, um, and were winning every race. It would be like Ferrari might be better at Monaco or Red Bull might be better at Monaco. Uh, and then as soon as you got back to Baku, I mean, if I look back at the races... 2019 was a one two for them. 2018 would have been a one two if Bottas hadn't had the puncture. Hamilton would have won in 2017 without his headrest problem. And I think they won in 2016 with Rosberg. So it's not it's not a bogey track for Mercedes by any means. You're right. I thought they were gonna potentially even take a one two uh and have you know, a bit of competition from Max, but they're not really anywhere. Um, the FP2, it's difficult to look at the the order because if you look at the FP2 order, I think Alonso, yeah, Alonso is P6 and Giovinazzi was P7, which if they're up there in qualifying, then fair play. We're, we're on for a very mixed up grid That'd and an exciting race. It'd be a good quality watch along. It would. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I can't see, I can't see them being, 11th and 16th but they're certainly on the back foot compared to Red Bull and maybe even Ferrari it is a weird one because all the teams that did well in Monaco have sort of come into Baku and saying like don't expect the same again like Ferrari McLaren and I mean Ferrari seem to be having a great time out on the track today you know um, Carlos Sainz is doing a, a stunning job and like I'm just so impressed with how he's getting on at Ferrari. Charles Leclerc is doing a good job, but he's also making best mates with the barrier, um, which obviously we saw in FP2. Um, and it's becoming, very well, one, a costly mistake that he keeps making, but quite a common mistake, um, which I think if you think of like, the season so far, obviously, he's had this prang with the wall in FP2 in Baku, issues in Monaco, issues in Imola. So that's like a 50% like of his F1 weekend so far. He's he's found the wall and ruined his car. So not ideal, but yeah, it's, it is bizarre to see Mercedes struggling, if you want to call it that. Um, it could be something to do with the fact that these windy conditions are affecting these new floors that they've got. But I mean, Hamilton himself said that, you know, this, this morning in FP1, he thought he had a really good day. FP2, the car didn't feel so good, which I mean, it's obviously reflective of his 11th place finish. But hey, Mercedes do this all the time. And uh, I mean, look at the conversations we were having in preseason testing with all the, oh, Mercedes are going to struggle, they're going to do this. And Hamilton's got the majority of wins so far this season. So it could be that they're just having a, a bad time setting up the car. There's a lot of tension in the team, I feel as well. Obviously, I'm not in the team myself, like just from an outsider perspective, but 
with the dramas they had in Monaco and Lewis slating the team very publicly to the media and saying, it's not my fault, it's the team's fault. And then this issue with Bottas, which you thought, ah, oh, seemed like bad luck. And then you had Toto Wolff saying in the media that maybe it was partly Bottas's fault because he wasn't quite parked up in the space properly when he came in for his pit. And I don't know, it just seems like quite uncharacteristic for Mercedes to see so much drama attached yeah, to that team. there's quite a lot of... It, so, I don't know if the, the pressure's getting to him a little bit, but yeah, like you say, be. you never you never see sort of Toto Wolf or or like him say say this sort of thing. It seems very out of character. Yeah, so maybe it's having an impact within the team and making decisions and being able to see things clearly. Um, or maybe it was just a funky Friday and they'll be back on track tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I th- that's been a thing there, hasn't it? You know, Fridays have been typically this season quite difficult for Mercedes and then they've managed to claw back the time that they've been missing so you know we don't want to jump too many guns here just purely because we're we are expecting them to be fighting for pole come tomorrow <laughs> but um they've got they've clearly got a lot of work to do um so I think Hamilton even said uh, during FP2 that he didn't really know where the time is to be honest and that was on the soft tire and I think he was six laps into his his stint when that happened so yeah mystifying for Mercedes but you know that I'm sure they'll sort it out. Uh, it's just it's not it's not the easiest weekend or starts to the weekends that uh, we're used to seeing in in seasons gone by. Um, before we uh, you did kind of segue Katie into our third point, but we won't <laughs> go into there just yet. We'll go uh, we'll go to to the flexi wing drama and everything that's been spoken about at the moment around that. Uh, we will be releasing a video next week, sort of covering it all and explaining what's going on and exactly what's come out of Baku, um, but. Generally speaking, you know, there's been a lot of discussion as to the Red Bull rear wing and how much it's flexing under under force and you know at top speed. And I think it's four tons of force uh, the the cars go through when they're uh, at, at max speed, according to I think it was Anthony Davidson or maybe Paul Resta, but one of them said that. Um, so, so clearly, you know, there there is rules within the uh, the rule book where um, the car can only flex a certain amount of can only flex a certain amount, and if it flexes any more than that, then it's essentially not legal um and so there's all sorts of pointing fingers and people are doing it and it and it just seems like everyone's doing it to be honest to some degree because i think sky actually did a comparison between mercedes and the red bull rear wing and it looked very similar if you know if not the same so there's clearly a lot of drama red bull were the ones kind of coming into baku that seemed to be one of the ones that could have potentially been in trouble but then you look at what's going on and what's what you, you compare them and you don't really think there's much going on there but i guess it can be very fine margins between being legal and not yeah and and it's obviously the the mercedes sorry the red bull rear wing we're talking about that there's there's now this kind of drama on the uh front wing as well and um i think it's kind of been maybe missed a little bit but uh i'm sure people saw our post but They've now got these dots on the uh, on the rear wing, so you can see how much. So the FIA have put that on every single team, uh, but they've also done it on the front wings. And um, Christian Horner, when asked about the protests on Sky F1, said, uh, "If I was Toto with the front wing he's got on his car, I would keep my mouth shut." <laughs> so he obviously believes that Mercedes have the same, uh, like theirs is not that legal. Uh, their front wing with the flexing. Uh, of what what they're saying so yeah great great drama I guess uh, pre-race drama great for um you know I'm sure drive to five will have a field day about it um mm. about you know the, they love their team bosses stories don't they where they're all um slating each other and stuff so I wouldn't be surprised I'm sure that sound bite is definitely going to be in <laughs> drive to survive <laughs> season four isn't it I think this whole flexi wing drama will be probably quite a um, big storyline and try to survive next year because it's been discussed it's one of those things that like it's been talked about since before Monaco really and it was it was known that it was all going to be coming down to Baku because that's when the FIA was sort of going to do something about it because there have been whispers of this is not right or their car is different and blah 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 blah, blah. and the FIA you know as much as we love to have a little FIA rant on this podcast um more, some teams have just been a bit unhappy with the fact that the FIA are like, oh, well, you know, it doesn't seem quite right, but we'll, we'll investigate it after Baku. And yeah, teams are saying, well, but people that have got illegal wings are going to get all the advantages in Baku because of the way the track is. Like, we want action now. Um, so 
yeah we'll we'll wait and see what happens but like you say they've got little stickers at the moment on all the teams um front and rear wings and they're going to be keeping a close eye on it but i think we predicted that maybe mercedes would protest red bull or red bull would protest mercedes by now but it hasn't happened but i'm not saying it won't happen it's just yeah it's it's literally like playground games of oh well he's got this and she's got that and i want that and it's just a bit silly but well, that's that's when you know mercedes are under pressure don't you mm. when when this all this drama starts happening because you know usually it's mercedes clean out front and they don't have to worry about yeah they've not had a second to protest here have they they've not had to protest for no it's just all the teams okay. pointing at them saying this is <laughs> that's illegal. um there's a question from o quilt should the fia be more lenient with innovative designs like das or the flexi wing from red bull no because you know the the rules are there as much as you know we're at the pinnacle of motorsport and you know formula one cars are the absolute you know they're the beasts of, of motorsport but at the same time there is a rule book and as soon as that's you know if if the fia have written something and then a team goes yeah but come on we're only two percent out or you know with the flex or whatever then it just becomes an absolute mess and you know there's millions and millions of pounds on the line between the the teams and where they finish and half a tenth here and there and you know the rule book not being followed completely it you, there's lawyers involved there's all sorts of things involved so they have to stick to the absolute rules coming into this season and if a team for example the das or whatever you know they find an, an, an innovative design that they can use for a little while the fia will usually then go yeah no it's not allowed anymore so they can change it in in that sense but lenience is not something that the fia can really do because as soon as they give give a bone to one of the teams they'll all start messing around and you know oh well you know you gave lenience to red bull with their flexi wing what about this and then yeah and then it'll just descend into carnage yeah teams will always try these quirky things and they're fun aren't they for they're fun for a little bit um until they start dominating and then we forget the novelty wears off and you're like i just wish they'd be a bit slower and please ban this so it's close um but <laughs> Yeah, the FAA can't be, they can't just be like, oh, this is really cool. Um, yeah, we should keep this because it's quite a cool feature like DAS or whatever. They, they can't do that. No. I mean, I'd like it if the FIA were a bit more relaxed with their rule book because like you say, F1 is the pinnacle of motorsport. And I think that the technology and the design that is used in F1 should be reflective of that. I don't think like to me, it comes across as bad press if Mercedes have come up with this like DAS for example, which is so intelligent and so clever. And then it just gets banned. Like I think the FIA should encourage teams to investigate like new technologies and stuff like that and perhaps you know Williams could come up with an absolute like genius idea and it would propel them into the midfield or even better but at the end of the day I also see your point of <laughs> you know if uh, they allow one thing through then someone else is going to come up with something and it could become quite difficult to manage so maybe it's easier to put everyone in one little box and say these are your rules don't break them yeah and and also I guess I would argue against that point in the sense of the the more creative freedom these F1 teams are given, the more likely we're going to get a Braun GP with a second down the, the road. That's uh, true. So the stricter Adrian the Newey rules, team, so. exactly. Yeah. So I, I feel like the stricter the rules, the the less they can do with the cars in some way. Of course, you know, they want to be creative and that is part of Formula One, but there has to be a limit, I think. Otherwise, it doesn't, it's not going to be a close. Yeah. Close yeah if, it was, if it was build a quick car. Mercedes and Red Bull would be even further ahead because they've got the most money and Ferrari. So. Not anymore, cost cap. Um, yeah, that's, what, that's what I mean. That's why it's good that they're yeah, yeah, cost yeah, cap. Yeah. Yeah. It... We've gone 50p over. I'll go and have it. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> um, right. Okay. Before we continue talking about Baku, uh, I wanted to mention something very exciting. Uh, if you're thinking about going to the British Grand Prix, then uh, we've launched uh, the WTF1 Clubhouse, which is essentially an opportunity to camp with us. And we've got all sorts of amazing things coming on. We've got special guests that are going to be announced very soon. Uh, we've got a literal clubhouse wave. We've got like a DJ, a stage. We're going to be doing live internet special reactions, all sorts of stuff. In fact, rather than me explaining it, just watch this very quick promo video. The awesome news keeps on coming. We're so excited to announce that we're hosting our very own WTF1 Clubhouse in partnership with 81 UK Power Drink at the British Grand Prix from the 15th to the 19th of July, where you can camp with us. 
So what does it include? You can hang out with myself, Tommy and Katie, watch us film content including Internet's best reactions live, get involved in Q&As with special guests, enjoy a big screen film night with BenQ screens, race on the simulators, drop some fire dance moves with our DJ and so much more. There's three options for camping, either bring your own tent or use one of our glamping bell tents. Visit WTF1.com forward slash clubhouse for all the info. Can't wait to see you all there. Cool. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, that video there, and we'd love to see you down there. Uh, and if you have any questions, queries, there's a web, uh, there's an email as well, uh, team at wtf1.com. Uh, if you have any problems or whatever, uh, just reach out to us, and we'd love to see you there, wouldn't we, Tommy and Katie? Absolutely. It's going to be good. It. Cool. Awesome. Right. Moving on. And Katie, you already brought this up, but fine. Didn't read the sheet. Leclerc mistake in <laughs> FP2. Uh, yes, he's loving hitting the wall at the moment, isn't he, around street tracks? Uh, Emmanuel John says, Charles Leclerc seems to be making far too many mistakes that are eventually taking up money in the cost cap era. I'm reading that very angri- angrily, but I'm re- <laughs> it kind of feels angry. Just passionate, just passionate. Angry, yeah. Is he under pressure from signs and his consistency? Very soon, signs is becoming Ferrari's Mr. Consistent. Okay, right. Come, John, John, right. Let's, let's wind it back a little bit here, mate. Yes, Carlos Signs definitely has been. Uh, the the most impressive in terms of moving to a new team, hundred percent. You know he's now pretty much on the pace of Charles Leclerc, which is no mean feat. You know Vettel got you know pretty trounced by him to be honest by that last season. So sorry Vettel fans, um, but at the same time, I don't know if it's him feeling the pressure as such. I feel like Charles Leclerc at the moment in his state in this stage of his career is prone to mistakes. That's part of what unfortunately he needs to eventually get out of his system if he wants to win a world title he's crashed around Baku before he's crashed in several places I think he crashed in uh in Imola in was it practice yeah practice Imola so he he is prone to a crash um so I don't know if it's pressure I think it's literally just he's trying to get the absolute maximum out of the car 90% of the time he will deliver it and there's that 10% where he'll just do a silly mistake or whatever so it's kind of almost Max Verstappen-esque in some ways but I'm mean, thinking Verstappen was actually crashing a lot more than that when he first came to Formula One. Sorry, Tommy. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm trying to get my point across. I feel like I have. Uh, Signs, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't say he's become Mr. Consistent if you look back to Imola, for example, where he went off the track about 800 times and then got away with it because of all the <laughs> you know, safety cars, whatever. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. It's obviously not ideal. Fortunately, he only took off his front wing. Yes, there is going to be, you know, money spent there in the fact that it's a cost cap and, you know, it's £75,000 for a new front wing or whatever. But, you know, that's that's in the budget. It's not like he's going to have a couple of front wings off and, oh, no, Charles Leclerc's going to have to start the Grand Prix with no front wing because they've run out. I don't think it's going to be that bad. But, uh, yeah, I, I just it think wages. it's... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, to be fair, he wouldn't see it. He wouldn't even notice it, would he? Yeah. But um, for me, yeah, I don't think it's him cracking under pressure or anything at the moment. I just feel like that's part of his unfinished driving yeah 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 great yeah don't don't worry about the uh verstappen thing because i was about to say exactly the same thing um but yeah verstappen you've got to think charles leclerc well it seems like he's almost a a veteran because he feels like he is this kind of as soon as ferrari get that car he could be in that mix with verstappen and hamilton um and yeah, there's only so much you can say this. Of course, if it keeps happening, it will be one of those things where you're like, yeah, he really needs to, he really needs to stop crashing or or make making these mistakes. It becoming a thing, especially when science is performing so well, and then the pressure could could build. But Verstappen did something similar in 2008, uh, a lot worse. Like you say, he crashed um, pretty much seven. I think it was seven from seven at the start of 2018 or 17, 18. Uh, and yeah, in various sessions, whether it be a race or a practice or a, a, a qualifying, um, and look at Max Verstappen now. This is where I jinx him, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but he's he's cut a lot of those mistakes out, and he seems like such a complete and amazing driver now. Max has got a few years on of experience more than Leclerc, um, and in a similar way to Verstappen, ex- exactly what you said, Matt. That he is he is driving a car that's not quite there so he's pushing every bit out he can whereas because he wants to be up there with with max and lewis but he can't be because the car's not quite there yet so that's probably you know why you know he's making these mistakes and it's better to do it now uh, and get out of your system that like max exactly like what max has done now that when he does get that 
championship worthy car where he can win a championship in a car that's when he needs to do exactly what Max is doing now where he's cut those mistakes out he's not crashing every other race even if it's only in a practice session um so I don't think there's too much to worry about yet but I think maybe maybe if there's two or three more then I think I th- mm. think that that narrative will maybe pick up a bit more steam but at the end of the day it's just a practice session yeah yeah it's better that he does this in practice than he does in qualifying and ends up not being able to start the race from pole position <laughs> uh but yeah like you say he's, he- he's still young in his career <laughs> He's still young in his career, and um, although he's hailed as sort of like the golden boy at Ferrari because of how he managed, like you say, to absolutely trump Vettel last year, who is obviously a four-time world champion, um, there's a lot of expectations on his very young shoulders, but he's got a very aggressive driving style, likes to get the absolute maximum out of that car, Um, so like you say, it's better for him to iron out these imperfections in his early days of his career than to be doing it you know when he has got a Ferrari underneath him that is capable of winning championships which I hope does happen um and yeah it is interesting though to see how well science is doing but we'll we'll see how he gets on over the course of the races because that's when it matters indeed um of course Ferrari are as we say kind of in the mix as well we haven't really mentioned the fact they are actually in the mix this weekend by the looks of things at least from Friday practice and McLaren as well uh, looking pretty good especially in the hands of Lando again although he did make have that spin in FP1 so we didn't see exactly where uh, he would have ended up but I think he would have topped the session to be honest in FP1 had he uh, just had a clean last sector Pedro underscore 2003 do you think Ferrari and McLaren can join Mercedes and Red Bull in that top bracket before the end of the season or at least for some races yeah I think it's more a case of at least for some races there's clearly the street track vibes where well especially with the slower sections of the track is where Ferrari come into their own um McLaren seem pretty decent especially with the Mercedes power unit um you know they've got a huge amount of power and that's good um I don't think they'll be there consistently because Mercedes and Red Bull just have that edge but if they start tripping over each other Ferrari and McLaren certainly going to get involved I don't think Ferrari will be on the front row come tomorrow but they'll be in that sort of fourth, fifth position, maybe a couple of tenths off because they didn't weren't, didn't actually look that quick in long run pace in FP2. At least they weren't the the pace of Red Bull where they were just seemed to be clear out in front, especially in the hands of Sergio Perez. So they're clearly taking the right steps. I think it will depend on the characteristics of the track when we get to the more natural sort of Silverstones and stuff. I fully expect Mercedes and Red Bull to be out in front, um, but maybe the more niche tracks where setup is absolutely vital. Um, not that it isn't vital for some tracks, but it's a bit harder to dial the car in. I think that's where we see Ferrari and McLaren. Yeah, they're, a bit def- closer. they're definitely a lot closer than last year, especially in Ferrari's sense. Um, and you're, you're right. I can't, I can't see them, especially with the end of the season, there's no point going absolutely ham on development when there's such a big rule change next year. So there's not really much pressure for them to catch up uh, either because, you know, you, you just hope that that comes next year when we've got the new the new regs and the new cars but unless something odd happens it does feel like it's mercedes and red bull but because mclaren uh and ferrari are closer it only takes a little bit of a slip up now from mercedes say say they say like friday's a washout and they don't have that luxury of a two hours of practice to get the car dialed in then maybe that's where like you know Charles Leclerc and pop it ahead of Bottas or something but I can only see them being up there when Merck or or a Red Bull has a particularly bad day yeah I think it's been unusual to see these like sprinkling of Ferrari brilliance because we weren't really expecting it at all in Monaco and then like I said they came into Baku and were like don't expect too much from us and then in FP1 I think it was Ferrari yeah two three um ahead of or yeah behind Verstappen so um, it's possible, but I think for McLaren, they'll just get the results that they can now. Um, and then perhaps when we go to more um, Mercedes, but like circuits that are better for a Mercedes power unit, then they'll excel there. But yeah, I don't think we're going to be seeing them fighting with Mercedes and Red Bull. I think they're just going to fly off into the distance and do their own thing. But we can hope. The fight is really interesting between the two of them. Yeah. That it is so good that even, even though obviously we're being a bit 
I mean, negative, but realistic that they're not going to be challenging for the championship with, with Red Bull and Mercedes. It is, it does seem like a really good battle between those two where it's going to be like circuit dependent where that battle for third between them, they're going to have to, yeah, pick up the best points they can on the circuits that that they're suited to. And let's not forget uh, a wild Pierre Gasly as well, just popping in the mix occasionally. Yeah. Uh, it, we've kind of just got used to him sitting in sort of P5 territory, or just just random. Just <laughs> It doesn't really get spoken about a huge amount. He's just doing an absolutely stellar job. He's P5 and FP2 and only four tenths of a second uh, behind Perez. And, uh, you know, they, they like to, to mock in commentary, well, not mock, but, you know, say that, oh, you know, Gasly would look pretty good to move to Red Bull, but he's already gone and, and that's gone very badly. So, um, yeah, so we have, we have the occasional Gasly up there. The Sonoda hype train has officially run out of steam, <laughs> I think. Oh, no. Uh, it's, at, it's got no fuel left, to be honest. I think uh, Tommy's going to be in big trouble come the end of the season. Um <laughs> Any any thoughts on that, Tommy? Very quickly. No, 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 no comment. <laughs> no, no, good, I didn't think so. Um, Sharath Let's underscore R out. underscore Nake did Danny Rick call Katie Fairman and take up, her up on her advice about sim work? Well, he's he's gone back in the sim, hasn't he? And uh, he has. People were saying that he's had a good Friday. Uh, P five in FP one, but realistically, Lando without that spin was going to go fastest. It was a second. It was it was. 0.9 up and I saw people obviously getting really excited that he was P1 for a little bit but realistically you're right he wasn't that high wasn't yeah he was P1 because not many people had done a representative lap time and then uh, in FP2 13th uh, and just under three tenths of a second behind Lando so uh, people were saying he's had a good, having a good weekend I'm not so sure about that <laughs> I think yeah. that uh, we'll wait for, for Saturday obviously to to pass judgment but yeah, I think people that are going, oh, he's having a great weekend, need to maybe hold fire on that until we see. Because Baku, if he doesn't perform in Baku, where he's literally mm. pulled off unbelievable moves, of course, it's in a Red Bull, completely different. He's known for this amazing breaking prowess, but he's in a completely different car now, as I think Anthony Davidson uh, described really brilliantly, was the fact that, you know, people say, you know, he's known to be this confident last of the late breakers, but if you don't have the machinery or not comfortable with the machinery, machinery you're in, you can't produce the three man overtake that you do a few years ago and you know he's a race winner around Baku so but then he was a race winner around Monaco as well and he was nowhere so yeah and Andreas Seidel actually was interviewed wasn't he during free practice and he was saying that you know it will come and they know what what the problem is and things like that but there's only so much you can do or the rest of it's confidence and I think if Danny Rick doesn't come out of Baku with some confidence I think he might struggle for the rest of the season yeah he really needs to have a good good weekend Monaco is an odd an unusual race so you kind of can even though it was absolutely dreadful for him you can kind of throw it throw it away and think right you need to be back on it because he doesn't really have the excuse anymore now looks like Perez might have upped his game a little bit this weekend and science we've said so many times is just performing so well that I think science is the one that's putting a lot of pressure on these <laughs> these drivers that have switched teams to really step up and almost not have an excuse to say oh well i need i need six seven eight races to get up to speed because science is like done pretty damn well straight away so um yeah he needs a he needs a good race more more simulator pictures for katie clearly yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no so uh danny rick gave me a call um and said i listen to the podcast religiously you know i think obviously you're the best member and i'll listen to everything you say um take it on board and I'll pop some pictures on Instagram to prove I've been in the sim and I was like no worries babes take care good luck in Baku all that kind of stuff so <laughs> that's how that For went those down that don't understand British sarcasm that's a lie yes uh, oh, yeah there will be people believing that I forgot about yeah that. oh yes. uh, yeah <laughs> yeah uh so no no phone call from Danny Rick but um interesting that he did you know, say that he was going to spend lots of time on the simulator. He seems very positive coming into Baku, which is good because, as we said, he left Monaco in a pretty bad place, I think. Um, he explained it, I think it was on F1, that some people might have got off the Danny Rick hype train after Monaco, but hopefully they've had the little break and they'll pop back on again and then off we go. Toilet so, break. Yeah, <laughs> literally. <laughs> oh, I did that's a joke to a previous podcast thing that we talked about. But, um, yeah, that 
I hope he does well in, in Baku. Saying that, I have just been reminded of my prediction for Azerbaijan, so I should probably briefly move on. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, one final thing to talk about is the wind. Obviously, it's known as the windy city, windy, whatever it is. Is, very, just is very that windy. official? Um, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, actually. they have loads of nicknames. Though. They're like the land of fire, the the windy city, the yeah, yeah lots of things. Lots of things. Um, but it is windy uh, uh, once again. Uh, Grey Eleven says, "How much do you think the wind will play a part on Sunday? Seems to be blowing a lot of rubbish on the circuit. Never mind the stability issues. I think the stability stuff, whatever you know, they're used to it being windy round Baku. It's not exactly a an anomaly. It's not like a one off where it's not usually windy. So I think that's something they would have prepared for. As for the rubbish, I think an F two car picked up a coke can or something, didn't it, or something um, in <laughs> practice. So oh, wow. yeah, I heard something or drinks can, whatever it was. Um, so clearly they just need to do a bit more uh, of um mopping up after mopping themselves up. <laughs> so it sounded weird uh but yeah litter get rid of it um but yes i think as well wasn't there a uh marshal that jumped on the track because there was a vsc during fp1 mm. For, mm. for something or other i don't think it was actually debris from a car i think it was just something that had blown onto the track so yeah clearly a little bit of rubbish going around which is never ideal and especially when they're going over 200 miles an hour down the long straight you don't want to be picking up a coke can at that point do you yeah, exactly. I hope I hope it's like uh, 2018. We were there, weren't we, in 2018? And I remember waking up race day and thinking there's absolutely no way this race can even happen <laughs> because it was so windy, you could barely walk because it was blowing you over. Um, and that was the year it was absolutely crazy where you had a massive headwind on the straight. So you could be, you, you didn't even have to be within DRS on the straight. If you watch the uh, sorry, Red Bull fans, to remind you of the, the crash between Ricardo and Verstappen. But if you watch that on board, I'm sure Ricardo is about 1.1 seconds behind going into the final corner or, or, or barely even like a second behind. Um, and the slipstream is so strong that he could just, everyone was just getting the most absolutely outrageous slipstream. So let's hope if it is windy, we get the headwind again because that that's what made the race really good because... 2019 was not great let's be honest 2018 was a banger because of because of that so yeah yeah that that plus safety car um, yeah the safety car restarts is seven wide doesn't it yeah. i think if they have a tailwind down the straight they'll probably be breaking land speed records and probably about 300 <laughs> miles an hour by turn yeah, one true. So. like mario kart <laughs> <laughs> absolutely um okay so that's it tommy final thoughts um well done, Baku. <laughs> Brilliant. Katie. Um, well done, Sergio Perez, for topping FP2. <laughs> a practice session. Well done yeah. for practicing harder than others or practicing quicker. We take uh, the wins. It's no, yeah, win. he, does, he does look good. Um, but he also looked good, I think, in another practice session. I Monaco, can't remember which one it was. FP1 also where, uh, that. Yeah, but there was, I, th I don't know if it was Monaco. I think it was one, uh, it wasn't a street track, but he was still looking good in race trim. I think it was uh, Portimao. Uh, but he wasn't able to show it because his qualifying wasn't great. And then, yeah. So he has to be able to deliver in qualifying, get himself top four. Then he can put that race pace to, to good. Then you might give him higher than a B in ABCDF1. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. We'll see where he finishes. <laughs> uh, right. miracles. <laughs> exactly. Um, final thoughts from me is uh, to join Team WTF1. If you haven't heard, it's something that we've uh, we've started, which is giving you exclusive content behind the scenes, all sorts of amazing stuff, both online, sort of giving you a live podcast uh, and other awesome bits and bobs, but also doing some in real life events. So, for example, this WTF1 Clubhouse uh, is exclusive to Team WTF1 members, and uh, yeah, we've got so much, so many things coming up uh, that uh, I I'm actually really excited for some of the things we're going to be announcing soon. So, there's an extra podcast. Go check it out. There's, There's an extra, extra podcast, podcast right now for people that want even more of us. Even more. <laughs> uh, and just to reiterate, you don't have to join Deep Team WTF1 in, in terms of you're not going to lose any content. We're not taking anything away from you guys. We're just giving ourselves more work. So... <laughs> 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 uh, which is which is really fun and we can interact a lot more with our team wt1 members as well which is which is really cool so uh yeah and also make sure to check out the clubhouse as i mentioned come and uh, camp with us at silverstone for the british grand prix we'll be partying hard there'll be a dj uh, to tommy's going to be doing some break dancing i've heard um, <laughs> which is something i'm really looking forward to uh casey you're going to be on the decks is that correct um i am yeah yeah and i'll be on too the busy mic. too busy calling daniel ricardo yeah <laughs> 
yeah, I'm you'll be, never going to live that down. You'll be using the sound system to get Danny Rick to come over. <laughs> Danny! <laughs> anyway, <Please. laughs> thank you so much, everybody, for watching and listening. Give us five stars, all that good stuff. Hashtag WTF1 podcast if you want to get involved next time. And we'll see you very soon. Wow, thumbs up from both Tommy and Katie this time. Two from Katie. See you later. Bye. 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 Well done, Bye. Baku. Oh, the predictions. Uh, yeah, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> It's fine. Just go watch the other podcast. Yeah. Uh, the same that's being fastest. Strawback qualifies. Vettel was me. Tommy is Mercedes one two. Vettel in the points again. And Katie's Ferrari double points finish. And Ricardo not in the points again. Bye.